Hello friends, this is Jim here with Science Talk, and here we go. In the first of quite a few videos, I'm going to be discussing uh, ocean atmospheric oscillations. So um, let's get right to it here. And uh, now let's see if I can make myself disappear for a bit. Okay, so ocean atmosphere oscillations. These are processes that produce globally, apparently erratic climates. We have the North Atlantic Oscillation, atmospheric pressure center switch back and forth across the Atlantic, switching wind and storms. We have El Nino, La Nina Southern Oscillation, commonly referred to as ENSO. This is probably the, uh, the one that's most widely known by the general public. And this involves shifts in atmospheric pressure over uh, the central equatorial Pacific Ocean and it's dominating global climate for over a year at a time. You know, it will do that for a year at a time. 1997-2000 ENSO cost $36 billion and, and result in the deaths of thousands. Then there's the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, which is a warm, cool cycle that swings over the Pacific over several decades. There are others. There is the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is, tends to be uh, found mostly north of 20 degrees north latitude. I actually consider the IPO to be kind of like a sub uh, player with the PDO. They both tend to have uh, cycles on the order of decades. And there is another one, the uh, Arctic Oscillation, which tends to work closely with the North Atlantic Oscillation. And then there's also the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, the AMO. That's Again, that's sort of like the answer to ENSO, but on the Atlantic side. And there's two more recently identified cycles, one called the Indian Ocean Dipole, another one called the Arctic Dipole. And over the course of several videos, I'm going to be discussing every single one of these. Let's, this video will be uh, dedicated to discussing ENSO. So let's... Uh, so here we have... Uh, this is the Arctic Oscillation, something call, called the NAM, and then there's a counterpoint, the SAM, down in the, uh, uh, around Antarctica. I will not be discussing SAM. Here is the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Atlantic Multidecadal, ENSO, the PDO, and then here's the IOD. Over here, about going to the Russia side, it would be the Arctic Dipole. I'm going to be discussing each one of these over the next uh, several videos. Okay, so let's let's get going. And so El Nino Southern Oscillation. And it's a little description, some background information. It's an irregularly periodic variation in winds and sea surface temperature over the tropical eastern Pacific Ocean, affecting the climate of much of the tropics and subtropics. The warming phase of the sea temperature is known as El Nino, the cooling phase as La Nina. Now, the reason why it was called El Nino is that uh, off the coast of South America, the western coast of South America, which would be the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean, uh, Peruvian farmers would notice that every seven or so years, plus or minus, their anchovy catch, you know, how much anchovies they caught and fished, would drop. And this seemed to occur around the time of Christmas. That's why they call it El Nino, referring to, because El Nino is the boy, or the boy child. And so it was a reference to the fact that this phenomenon seemed to occur around Christmas, almost like once a decade, plus or minus, a little less. So that's where, that's how the name came about. The Southern Oscillation is a company atmospheric comp component. So... So El Nino, La Nina refer to sea temperature, sea surface temperatures to be a little more accurate. And Southern Oscillation refers to what's happening to the high and low pressure systems in the atmosphere. 
and then that couples with the sea temperature change. El Nino is accompanied by high air surface pressure in the tropical Western Pacific, La Nina with low air surface pressure at the same location. The two periods last several months each and typically occur every few years with varying intensity. It's actually in three states. It's commonly thought of as a single state for the climate phenomenon. It's actually in three states. You got the opposite phases of El Nino, La Nina, which requires certain changes in the ocean and the atmosphere, because it is a couple climate phenomenon. And the neutral is basically what you get in between. So when it goes from El Nino to La Nina, it goes through a neutral phase. And then on the way back from La Nina to El Nino, again, go through a, a neutral phase. And so cycles typically last from about six to maybe 24 months, but the cycle varies uh, ra uh, rapidly when compared to other oscillating systems on the planet. Now, it cycles on that, right? But when you get the strong El Nino or the strong La Nina, uh, that's when you start getting into about the five to 10 year uh, cycle. Okay. El Nino is a warming of the ocean surface or above average sea surface temperatures, hence referred to as SST, in the central and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. Over in Indonesia, rainfall tends to become reduced while rainfall increases over the tropical Pacific Ocean. The low level uh, surface winds, which normally blow from east to west along the equator, easterly winds, weaken or in some cases actually blow from west to east become westerlies. And when you have wind blowing, it, the wind is also pushing on the ocean surface. We call that wind stress. And as it pushes on the wind, it's gonna cause the water to pile up at the end of where the wind stops blowing. So that's, that is a critical component of what happens with ENSO. In fact, for many years, oceanographers did their things, atmospheric scientists did their thing, and it wasn't until in the last several decades that I said, hmm, it's really a couple system and we need to start uh, collaborating more so. Because no matter how you look at it, whether it's the atmosphere or, or the ocean, they're both considered to be fluids. Now I say fluids, not liquids. So they behave like fluids. The difference being the uh, internal viscosity and density. Viscosity is a measure of a uh, fluid's uh, internal friction. So La Nina is a cooling of the ocean surface or below average sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern Pacific, tropical Pacific. Over Indonesia, rainfall tends to increase while rainfall decreases over the central tropical Pacific Ocean. The normal easterly winds along the equator become stronger. So if for folks who live, say, in Indonesia, Australia, that area, when La Nina is in place, you're going to get rained on a lot more. When El Nino is in place, you're going to see very little precipitation. You might see some dry and drought conditions. Neutral, neither or. Right? Often tropical Pacific SETs are generally close to average. Some instances it may look like it's in one or the other state, but the atmosphere is not playing along. Kind of, I put a little fun on it. Okay, now this here, this graphic is simply showing the major uh, surf, ocean surface currents on the planet, okay? And you know, for example, here's the Gulf Stream, right? Becoming the uh, northward drift, right? North Atlantic drift. Then we have uh, you know, the, the Canary Return Island. So this is a nice gyra system here. You have a, a north equatorial uh, current in the Atlantic side. Then you have a counter current, which goes against, and then you have similar things in the uh, South Atlantic. The arrows indicate the direction of flow. Um, the fuchsia or magenta colored are warm water. The blue are cold water currents. Here's the Antarctic circumpolar, something called the west wind drift. This is what totally rings around Antarctica. Goes all the way around. On the Pacific, here is the nice North Pacific gyra. You have a little cold water gyra that rotates in the opposite direction. A little later on, I'll be explaining about gyras and cyclones and so forth. But let's just state for now 
that because the gyra in the Gulf of Alaska rotates in a counterclockwise manner is a reason why this region is very productive in fisheries because you have a nice upwelling in the middle of this bringing loads of nutrients. Right. So here you have uh, the equatorial, the south equatorial current, the north equatorial current. In between is the equatorial counter current. It is these three major currents that when they go, which way they're blowing, how strong they're, they're flowing, is what ENSO will be affecting. And then we have sort of like a, a double gyro system in the South Pacific. Uh, when the North Equatorial hits about the Indonesia region, it actually bifurcates and you have part of what's called the Kuroshio current, which goes alongside Japan. Um, and then you have a, another current that flows down this way, uh, you know, towards you know, the Australia side of things. So, you know, I just want to point this out. Uh, you got here are the major uh, oceanic uh, currents, surface currents. So these are all horizontal flowing. So this does not indicate any vertical current like thermohaline or anything like that. And then you got a few in the Indian Ocean, and etc. So um, I want to, you know, to just so you can get, have an idea of when we start talking about the currents, you, know, you can always refer back to this figure to get your bearings, but this is kind of give you a, an orientation. So here is uh, from December 1988. This is a, a satellite imagery of sea surface temperatures. And you can see very cool conditions in the eastern Pacific equatorial region. We have a La Nina, and there it is uh, a year before. So this, so this is December 88, and this is the year before December, uh, oh, actually uh, uh, 97, so, so 11, nine years later, a very strong uh, El Nino. So what you see here, and just so you understand the temperature scale, this is the difference from average temperature. So when you see white, okay, doesn't mean there was no reading. It means that all this is average temperature recorded. The darker blue it is, the colder it is, the more it deviated less than the average. Conversely, the more red it is, the hotter it deviated from average. So this was really a lot colder than average. Not so cold there, not so cold there. And this is really hot, not so hot, say, there. I think you get the idea. Okay, and again, that this describes the last two figures I just showed you. Maps of sea surface temperature anomaly in the Pacific Ocean during a strong La Nina and then a, a strong El Nino. And I know here you can see the Humboldt current up California. Notice how sea surface changes for this current as well as the Gulf of Alaska where the counterclockwise rotating gyro is found, a region of the ocean characterized by good productivity. Okay. Right here, here's the Humboldt current. And right down here, here's the Atlantic, uh, the Alaska, uh, Gulf of Alaska gyro. And again, you can still see traces of the Humboldt current coming down. During an El Nino, the warm eastern Pacific water suppresses upwelling, resulting in the collapse of the anchovy fisheries. No nutrients brought up. This reverses during La Nina. The La Nina of 88 was a strong one. In February of 89, interior Alaska had one of the coldest months ever, with temperatures averaging minus 62 degrees Fahrenheit, reaching an official low of minus 67 Fahrenheit, with reported lows of minus 80 Fahrenheit. I was there uh, at where I was living. It was minus 72 Fahrenheit. This lasted for two weeks. No plane or trains were able to travel to Fairbank. It was too cold. If you had a heating device that required fuel to operate, it didn't happen. Basically, those who had wood stoves were very popular because you can always get a wood stove going. And when it did, quote unquote, warm up, it was still around minus 40 to minus 45 degrees Fahrenheit. This is 30 years ago. Now temperatures hardly get to even 50 below 
And if they do, it does not last long, typically less than a week. This just shows you how drastically things have changed here in the Arctic due to climate change. But uh, yeah, that, that La Nina, you know, that lasted into 89. Holy crap was that cold. There was a, a brand new creature that was discovered. It was called the snow snake. And it, all these uh, snow snakes were black. Basically what it was, was it got so cold that if anyone even was stupid enough to try to start their vehicle, the fan belts just snapped. They had contracted so much and gotten so brittle. Normally, the north of Flung Humboldt Current brings relatively cold water from the Southern Ocean to uh, north of along uh, South America's west coast to the tropics. It's kind of confusing. It's a, there's a Humboldt Current in both the north and the south side. Whereas enhanced by an upwelling taking place along the coast of Peru, Along the equator, trade winds cause the ocean currents in the eastern Pacific to draw water from the deeper ocean to the surface. It's called a, uh, con a conservation of volume, and this will cool the ocean surface. Under the influence of the equatorial trade winds, as cold water flows westward along the equator, where it's slowly heated by the sun, as a direct result, sea surface temperature in the western Pacific are generally warmer by about 8 to 10 degrees C than those in the Eastern Pacific. This warmer area of ocean is a source for convection, i.e. atmospheric cells, and associated with cloudiness and rainfall. During El Nino years, the cold water weakens or disappears completely as the water in the Central and Eastern Pacific becomes as warm as the Western Pacific. And I'll show you graphics on this later. All right, ENSO is a nice catch-all acronym for all three states. And why doesn't it have the La Nina in it? Uh, that's because La Nina was, before it was even recognized, this is what I referred to earlier about El Nino occurring around the, uh, the Christmas holidays. Sir Gilbert Walker discovered the sudden oscillation or large scale changes in sea level atmospheric pressure across Indonesia and the tropical Pacific. He did not realize that it was linked to changes in in the Pacific Ocean or El Nino. It wasn't until the late 1960s that Jacob Bajerknees and others uh, realized that the changes in the ocean and the atmosphere were connected. And we got the and so <laughs> term. The two phases related to the Walker circulation as discovered by Gilbert Walker during the early 20th century. The Walker circulation is caused by the pressure gradient force that results from high pressure system over the Eastern Pacific and a low pressure system over Indonesia. Okay, uh, what's meant by a gradient? If, it, if I have one area, higher, higher air pressure, or higher, let's say, and it's lower in another region, the tendency, you have a difference. So the tendency is to flow from high to low. And you're gonna, the air is gonna move in that direction. Think of if I open up a can of rancid whatever and I stick it in the corner of a room, what happens to people at the other corner of the room, you know, at the opposite end of the room? Eventually, you're going to smell it. Why is that? Because the molecules, which were a high concentration where I opened up the can initially, they start to disperse to the section of the room where the concentration is less. It's that idea. So weakening or reversing or reversal of the water circulation decreases, eliminates the upwelling of cold deep seawater, thus creating an El Nino by causing the ocean surface to reach above average temperatures. And especially strong water circulation causes a La Nina, resulting in cooler ocean temperatures due to increased upwelling. So here is and there's the Southern Oscillation Index correlated with mean sea level pressure. Calculate from monthly deseasonalized data from this gentleman here, Connolly. So what do we have here? Again, the white is normal. So we see the, the isoplex lines of a zero. Okay? This is positive 0.2 off of positive 0.6. Over here is negative 0.2 down to negative 0.6. That's even negative 0.8. So there's higher pressure here, lower pressure here.
Okay, the walk of circulation is caused by the pressure gradient force that results from a high pressure system over the Eastern Pacific and a low pressure system over Indonesia. That's what this shows. The walk of circulation in the tropical Indian Pacific and Atlantic basins result in westerly surface winds in northern summer in the first basin, easterly winds in the second and third basins. As a result, the temperature structure of the three oceans display dramatic asymmetries. The equatorial Pacific and Atlantic both have cool surface temperatures in northern summer in the east, while cooler surface temperatures prevail only in the western Indian Ocean. This is related to the Indian Ocean dipole, which as it turns out seems to be tied into, you guessed it, and so. These changes in surface temperature reflect changes in the depth of the pycnocline. That's the change in density. Changes in a walk of circulation with time occur in conjunction with changes in surface temperature. Some of these changes are externally forced, such as seasonal shift of the sun into the northern hemisphere in summer. Other changes appear to be the result of coupled ocean atmospheric feedback in which, for example, easterly winds cause the sea surface temperature to fall in the east, enhancing the zonal heat contrast and hence intensifying easterly winds across the basin. These anomalous easterlies induce more equatorial upwelling and raise the pycnocline in the east, amplifying the initial cooling by the southerlies. This coupled ocean atmospheric feedback was originally proposed by Bjorknes. From an oceanographic point of view, the equatorial cold tongue is caused by easterly winds, where the Earth climate is symmetric about the equator, cross equatorial wind would vanish, and the cold tongue would be much weaker and have a very different zonal structure than we see observed today. During non El Nino conditions, the walk of circulation is seen at the surface as easterly trade winds that move water and air warmed by the sun toward the west. In the at atmosphere, easterly means winds come out of the east, go to the west. In oceanography, if we say easterly currents, it means it goes towards the east. I know, it's confusing. <laughs> and, this what, and this movement helps create upwellings off the coast of Peru and Ecuador, brings nutrient cold rich water to the surface, increasing fish stock. The western side of the Pacific, Equatorial Pacific is characterized by warm, wet, low pressure system as the collected moisture is dumped in the form of typhoons and thunderstorms. And then you get, you know, the ocean is some 60 centimeters higher in the Western Pacific as a result of this motion. So here's a nice little figure showing the Walker circulation. So we have solar heat inputting in, we have evaporation. Here's the Walker circulation. As you can see, it's atmospheric. So this is the Western side. This is the Eastern side. This is longitude. Okay. Basically right here is the international dateline. <laughs> Here's Lima, Peru, etc. So when you have warm water, remember as I've always described for you guys, warm water is warmer, so it's going to expand. Okay. That's why it shows a little tilt here. This line right here, they're labeling as the thermocline. I technically it's the pycnocline. But let me say this at least, in the equatorial regions of the ocean, changes in density of oceanic water is going to be determined more so by changes in temperature. Salinity does not vary all that much. So the temperature is gonna be more the varying uh, uh, parameter, and hence it's gonna be the more driving of the density. So I understand from that point of view why they would refer to it as a thermocline. But you still have a salt content there. So I would, I would prefer seeing pycnocline. Unfortunately, in a, in a lot of the graphics I'm going to show you in, in this video series, they're going to be, you're going to see thermocline. When you get to high latitudes, it's the salt content that changes drastically. The water is really cold. So the water temperature is not going to vary that much. But it's the salinity content will. So 
salinity differences drive the density differences in uh, waters at high latitude, temperature differences at water at you know, equatorial regions. So this is, this is a diagrammatic uh, showing the relationship, the walk of circulation with the air pressures, high pressure, wet pressure. And this wet, this low pressure shifts back and forth during ENSO. Okay. So we have Hadley cells and atmospheric uh, circulation pattern, as is the Walker cell. Now, if you look here, we're going from zero to 40 degrees north latitude. This is showing you a cross section in depth. So here's a little bit of warm water intrusion, cold water. Uh, reaching down. The EUC is the equatorial undercurrent. So this is a subsurface of flow. And as you can see, we've got warmer waters here. Here's the main forcing. Okay, the winds going east to west, piling up the water this way. Okay. And we see the atmospheric uh, flow as well. And then what we're seeing here, these are are some vertical flows in the ocean itself. So you got a little bit of, of convective cells going on. That's basically what all these are. These are all convection cells. You know, it gets warm, it rises, gets, then it cools, it sinks, that kind of deal. So, and this brings this, this cool water is coming to the surface. That's the upwelling, bringing nutrients, helping the fisheries along this way. So that, that was the diagram of the quasi equilibrium in the La Nina phase. Water circulation seen at the surface is easterly trade wind, which move water and warm, air warmed by the sun towards the west. Western side is characterized by warm, wet, low pressure, okay, and, and so on. Basically, uh, water and air are returned to the east because the result of this motion, where the water is some 60 centimeters higher in the western, the water and air return to the east. Because if I have water that's higher on one location and it's lower in another location, let's assume a flat bottom that's level. I have a higher pressure where the water is higher. In other words, the pressure exerted on the bottom will be higher because a, the water column is taller, exerting more pressure. It's lower where the pressure exerted on the bottom is lower because the water level is not as high. Guess what? That creates a pressure gradient. Water flows down the pressure gradient. Now, because this is occurring at the equator, the flow is in a straight line. When you get away from the equator and water flows down the pressure gradient, then the Coriolis effect acts upon it, deflecting the motion. In the northern hemisphere, it's to the right. In the southern hemisphere, it's to the left. That is how you set up oceanic gyros. And, and related to that, how you get cyclones and anticyclones. I will discuss that more so later on. Now let's look at sea surface temperature oscillations. Okay, NOAA in the U.S., sea, turf, sea surface temperatures in the Nino 3.4 region. I, I have a, a graphic will show you the, uh, the bay where, the, where the, st the stations are to collect the data. And it stretches from the 120th to the 170th meridians, west longitude, astride the equator, five degrees of latitude on either side are monitored. This region is approximately 3,000 kilometers to the southeast of Hawaii. And what they do is they calculate the most recent three-month average, or they do a running average. The region is more than 0.5 degrees C, above or below normal for that period, then El Nino or La Nina is considered in progress. UK's Met Office also uses uh, a several month period to determine ENSO state when the warming and cooling occurs for only seven to nine months. It's classified as El Nino La Nina conditions versus episodes. Neutral phase. Temperature variation of climatology is, is within half a degree, and so conditions described as neutral. Neutral conditions are the transition between warm and cold phases of ENSO. Ocean temperature, by definition, tropical precipitation, wind patterns are near average conditions during this phase. Close to half of all years are within neutral periods. 
during the neutral ENSO phase, other climate anomalous patterns such as the sign of the North Atlantic Oscillation or the Pacific North American Teleconnection pattern exert more influence. What the teleconnection refers to is atmospheric communications across oceanic basins. So that because of what whatever atmospheric cells are happening could result in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans communicating, for example. Warm phase, when the Walker circulation weakens or reverses and the Hadley circulation strengthens, we have an El Nino. Ocean surface is warmer than average. As upwell and cold water occurs less or not at all. El Nino associated with a band of warmer than average ocean water temperatures that periodically develops off the Pacific coast of South America. Okay. El Nino accompanies high air pressure surface temperature in the Western Pacific. That's the warm oceanic phase. Then the cold phase. This is when we get kind of the opposite. We get the La Nina. Sea surface temperatures across the equatorial eastern Pacific will be lower by normal than 3 to 5 degrees C. And, you know, we've got a few of the other little background information. As always, you can always pause the video to, you know, anytime, stop and look at the figures, read the descriptions. Transitional phases. At the onset of departure of uh, El Nino or La Nina can be uh, important factors in global weather by affecting teleconnections. Significant episodes known as Trans Nino are measured by the Trans Nino Index, TNI. Example of affected short time climate in North America include precipitation in the Northwest US, intense tornado activity in the contiguous US. Okay, so this is a diagram maybe a little simplified one from the one I showed you earlier. So we have warm waters push westward, surface wind blow westward. So here's a low pressure system. All right, you got some precipitation going on here. There might be movement to the east. Here's the warm water. Here's the cold water. Here's the thermal client. As you can see, the thermal client is angled up. It's bent. It's not level. And that's because warm water is transitioning gradually to cold water with the abrupt change over the thermal slash pycno climb. So here's normal conditions, convective circulation. Note the position of this low pressure system. Here's the thermal climb coming up to the surface or near the surface off the coast of South America. Here's the winds pushing the water, piling it up this way, warmer surface temperature this way. Equatorial winds, white arrows gather the warm water pool toward the west. Cold water upwells along the South American coast. This is normal or neutral, if you like. Now, look at El Nino. Okay, first of all, see how this pressure system has shifted. Right? It's gone to the east. And that creates two convection cells, this way and this way, instead of just a one. Now you see how the warm water is moved this way. You see how the thermocline slash picnocline is now deeper? It's depressed. You're not going to get the upwelling. Now you get this warm water off South America. Warm water pool approaches South American coast. The absence of cold upwelling increases warming. And then La Nina, you see how this low pressure system shifted even further west, right? You see it's, you line it up, it's about, uh, what would that be about? 105 degrees west latitude. You can see it's gone further. It's like about 110. You'll notice, again, looking at the, that the pool of warmer water is smaller. And we have colder water here. We still have the westerlies pushing the water, but not as strongly. And now the thermocline, technocline, basically reaches all the way to the surface. Warm water is farther west than usual. Strong upwelling is off South America. So that's kind of diagrammatically what's happening. And it's the shifting of what the winds are doing, what the sea surface temperature is doing, where the low pressure system is, is at, and all the forcings that come with that. As it turns out, it's, it's tied into the PDO. 
So here are, taken in December in three consecutive years. And so neutral, so this is sea surface temperatures. All right, look at the El Nino, see how much warmer it is on the Eastern Pacific side. And then here's the La Nina, you see this cool tongue? That's that tongue we referred to earlier. See this cool tongue? It's cooler than here and it stretches further west. See this right there, right there? This here is gone further to the west. So this is this is actual uh, actual satellite data. So again, white is the normal condition. If it gets the blue, it's colder than average. It gets the red, warmer than average. So that's the phases of uh, ENSO. And average ocean temperature. January to March, April to June, July to September, October to December. This is over a one-year period. And as you look at this, you can see that this is looking like a La Nina situation. It looks like we're transitioning a little bit. And then it it's, didn't quite go all the way, although it didn't quite get, it still got cold water off Peru and South America, but you know, a little warmer off Central America. It looked like it wanted to go into an El Nino, but it didn't quite. So now we look at, and by the way, uh, this is a good website. If you want to click on that to uh, you know, explore this in greater detail, go for it. Here is the uh, pressure system, okay, when El Nino. You see that these arrows indicate wind forcing, wind direction. The longer and or thicker the arrow, the stronger the winds are. These are called vector fields, by the way. So we got some very strong winds here, pretty much blowing right along the equator, and it's blowing from west to east. So it's pushing the water this way. And then La Nina, we get the reverse. Now, we put, now the wind is going this way. So this is um, sea surface temperature anomaly. That's here that this is separate from uh, this is the L and the H refer to the atmosphere. But the colors here refer to sea surface temperature, showing the coupling system. So it's a little cooler here. You can see it's a lot warmer here. And you can see the, the direction of the winds have changed. You can see that. So basically, you can see the flip-flop in these uh, conditions. OLR is outgoing long wave radiation. Okay, I'm not, don't worry about that. Right. Sea level pressure represented by high and low. High and low pressure center also tied into the atmosphere. And then we have the multivariate ENSO index. Now, when you calculate the ENSO index, what you're calculating, the, the parameters you're looking at are sea surface temperature, uh, sea surface heights, which gives you sea surface pressure, atmospheric pressure, you're looking at precipitation, you're looking at, uh, those are the main parameters, there are some other parameters, but those are the ones that I looked at and then they're calculated. And you'll note, uh, I'm including a lot of the, uh, where you can find this information if you want to do further uh, exploration in detail. So the oscillation is the atmospheric component. And this is an oscillation of surface air pressure. And it's called the strength, it's called the SOI. It's an oscillation index. El Nino episodes have negative SOI, meaning there's lower pressure over Tahiti and higher pressure in Darwin. La Nina episodes is the reverse. So they're basing on air pressure difference between Tahiti and Darwin, Australia on the Indian Ocean side. So they're kind of looking at a, a small distance. Low atmospheric pressure tends to occur over warm water, high pressure over cold water. Warm water is also where, you know, if you've got warm, you're going to have more evaporation, leading to, so you're going to have a thermal rising and one of the features of a low pressure system are updrafts downdrafts are, are a feature in a high pressure system and when you have high pressure 
system over the ocean. It's also going to push the ocean surface down, whereas a warm, uh, a low pressure system, the pressure is reduced. So in addition to the water expanding from thermal expansion, it's going to expand from the fact that there's reduced pressure on it. So it's going to, the sea level will also increase as well. And this is just some verbiage about the uh, Equatorial Southern Oscillation Index to help generate a better uh, values and calculations and a better understanding of the mechanisms. This is the uh, regions where air pressure are measured and compared to generate the SOI. So you got this region here, pressure anomaly over uh, Indonesia. And then here are some of your stations. Here's Tahiti, Darwin, that kind of stuff. So this is showing you the, uh, the location of where to collect the data. And this is just uh, zooming in on this bit here. And so you, you can see it's where they monitor the sea surface temperatures. That just gives you an idea where to, where to get the, uh, the data from. Okay, here we go. This is, this is the, the whole ball of wax. Here's the SOI. Negative values have an El Nino, which is a warming uh, situation for the ocean. La Nina is a cooling situation, and you have positive values. Now, you see this horizontal blue line this way. You see this horizontal red line this way. Sounds like a hockey rink, right? In between here is considered to be normal or neutral. So when you get to all these peaks this way and this way, this is when you have the episodes. Okay. This is a strong La Nina in 75, 76. Here is that La Nina of 88. This is a strong El Nino of 82, 83, and this is a very strong one. And we had a, a more recent strong one here. And this was for several years running of an El Nino situation. This is a strong dip down. And we're actually coming out of a La Nina recently. Kind of a strong one that way. So in between here is a neutral or normal. So you might have a, a sort of a, a condition, but not an episode where the lines go above or below, depending which side of the graph. Those are your episodes. What is the black line? Okay. The black line is 25 months weighted smooth. In other words, you're kind of trying to average out the values here. 25 months, it's over a two year period. Hence the lag and hence why it stops before. So you can see this shows you a somewhat cyclical nature to it. And here's the data source. Data is via the Australian government. SOI is calculated based on many parameters, sea surface temperature, air pressure, air temperature, geodesic height, sea level height basically, radiation incoming and outgoing, long wave radiation for example is outgoing, wind stress, that's the force of the wind on the water enforcing the currents, the direction of strain, and whether it's upwellings and downwellings. One can go to the NCAR, which is National Center of Atmospheric Research, in Boulder, Colorado learn, a website to learn more. And then the URL for the figure on the next slide, this one here, is, is basically similar to the first index slide I showed you, but kind of a little cleaned up so you can see things a little better. Yeah, here's that nasty uh, 88, 89 uh, La Nina. Now, the, actually, I just now noticed something. The, uh, the temperature, uh, the, uh, the number scales are reversed. These should be positive values, and these should be negative values. Because this, this is El Nino up here. This is La Nina down here. So here's that 2012. Yeah, so when you look at this, this is minus one, minus two, minus three. That's positive one, positive two, positive three. I didn't even catch that to just now. See, see, here's the here's La Nina, El Nino. See how right now, now the numbers are agreeing. 
So this is looking at a, a smaller time scale over basically, you know, 17 years or so. And uh, here's that uh, La Nina we're coming out of. Here's the El Nino we just had. Impacts on precipitation. Developing countries dependent upon agriculture and fishing, particularly those born in the Pacific Ocean, are most affected by ENSO. The effects of El Nino in South America are strong and are direct and strong. El Nino is associated with warm and wet weather months in April to October along the coasts of Peru and Ecuador. Yet major flooding. La Nina causes a drop in sea surface temperatures over Southeast Asia, heavy rains over Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia. So here we got some cold episode relationships. December to February, June to August. And as you can see, wet, dry, cool, right? You can right? wet and cool here. We've got to cool it here, cool it here. Right? Then in June, basically these graphics are describing what was just here. Okay. Warm, very wet months in April to October. April through October. Well, that would include here, June, uh, August. So it misses, don't have April, May, you don't have September, October, but you can see it's cool and it's gonna be cool, it's gonna be wet, as you can see here. So you can see how, you know, this is a course over a year, December, February. Now, along the equator, you're not gonna have the extreme seasonality that you would uh, in temperate and uh, sub uh, Arctic uh, latitudes, but still, nevertheless, it's going to be the insulation uh, received from the sun will will change, so it will affect things. Okay, which so let's look at El Nino. What happens? El Nino, warm, dry, warm, dry. Right? It's warm this way. It's wet and warm over here. It becomes warmer, like up into Alaska. Southwest gets wet. Southeast gets cool. This is a uh, wet and cool of the uh, U.S. Dry, warm, wet, etc. Dry and warm in uh, southeastern Africa. Australia tends to be hit with warm, dry conditions. And now with climate change and the heating becoming more pronounced, they're getting hit with drought conditions. Right. This is a... Uh, very detailed map showing uh, gra a graphic showing you what's going on. Areas become abnormally warm. Jet streams diverted by thunderstorm. Tropical thunderstorms intensify. You, know, you got a high pressure here, a low pressure here. Okay. Because don't forget, the low pressure during El Nino shifts to the east, leaving us with a high pressure here. During La Nina, that low pressure system shifts back to the west. I showed you those graphics earlier, where the, the high and lows uh, alternate. So during El Nino, that low pressure system goes to the east, leaving a high pressure system over this region of the planet, and then the, the reverse during a La Nina. So um, this is the international date line here. So low pressure area extends over the eastern tropical Pacific. Areas become abnormally wet. And then we're looking at the convective loops. Thunderstorms migrate to the central Pacific. El Nino, warm water, thermoclines depressed. So the no upwelling, cold water down below. Normal year, we can see the thermocline slanting upward, bringing cold weather. Again, here's that low pressure system that's to the west, but in El Nino, it shifts to the east. And don't forget, Look at the winds, right? The winds shift in direction as well, mainly driven by the uh, convection cells. And you can always pause these to ruminate and examine these uh, more closely. And in Alaska, La Nina events lead to dry to normal conditions, but you freeze your ass off. <laughs> well, at least you used to. El Nino events do not have a correlation towards dry or wet conditions, but it does tend to be a little warmer. El Nino increased precipitation expected in California due to a more southerly zonal 
storm track. La Nina increased precipitation is diverted into the Pacific Northwest due to more northerly storm track. La Nina events, the storm track shifts far enough northward to bring wetter than normal condition, i.e. more snowfall, to Midwestern states. And you get hot and dry summers to go along with that. During El Nino, increased precipitation along the Gulf, course, Gulf Coast and Southeast due to a stronger than normal and more southerly polar jet stream, which is, as it shows, is tied into the North Atlantic Oscillation. Late winter and spring during El Nino events, dry and average conditions expected in Hawaii. On Guam, during El Nino years, dry season precipitation averages below normal. The threat of tropical cyclone is over triple what is normal during El Nino years, so extreme shorter duration rainfall events are possible, but more severe. And so it's linked to rainfall of Puerto Rico, and so uh, El Nino, we have snowfalls greater than average across the southern Rockies and Sierra Nevada, well below normal across the upper Midwest and Great Lakes state. During La Nina, snow falls above uh, normal across the Pacific Northwest and Western Great Lakes. Associated for Alaska during Enso event is the Aleutian Low, which is associated, as we'll discuss, with the PDO. The Aleutian Low is a semi-permanent low pressure system located near the Aleutian Islands, hence the name, in the Bering Sea during the Northern Hemisphere winter. It is a climatic feature centered near the Aleutian Islands measured based on mean sea level pressure. One of the largest atmospheric circulation patterns in the Northern Hemisphere and represents one of the main, quote unquote, main centers of action in atmospheric circulation, influencing the path and strength of cyclones. The low serves as an atmospheric driver for low pressure systems, post-tropical cyclones and their remnants, and can generate strong storms that impact Alaska and Canada. Which is why when you go into the Bering Sea, you get the shit kicked out of you because you have nothing but storms there the whole bloody time. <laughs> Generally, intensity of low is strongest in the winter, almost completely dissipates in the summer. During ENSO event, not only are there shifts in SST regimes, sea surface temps, there is a course of behavior the Indonesian low pressure system, which moves east and west. That's that. The, the, the low that was been featured in the graphics as it does so does the Aleutian low so when that Indonesian system that low moves to the east as it does during El Nino it pushes the Aleutian low to the east as well and vice versa and of course this shapes the, the weather so what about global warming El Nino events cause short term, about one year in length, spikes in global average surface temperature, while La Nina events cause short term cooling. Therefore, the relative frequency of El Nino compared to La Nina events can affect global temperature trends on decadal time scales and coupled with the IPO, Interpacific, Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation. Over the last several decades, the number of El Nino events increase and the number of La Nina events decrease because we're warming the surface, and we're, that includes warming the ocean. Studies of historical data showed a recent El Nino variation is most likely linked to global warming. For example, one of the most recent results, even after subtracting the positive influence of the Kale variation is shown to be possibly present in the ENSO trend. The amplitude of the ENSO variability in the observed data still increases by as much as 60% in the last 50 years. So basically what they're saying here is accounting for uh, cyclical trends and other very normal variations, the resulting increase in uh, uh, increased El Nino activity is basically due to global warming. That's what they're saying. They have accounted for cyclical normal variation and we're still seeing uh, an, an upward trend. Future trends uh, are uncertain. Different models make different predictions. It may be observed phenomena more frequent and stronger El Nino events occurs only in the initial phases of the global warming and then for example after the lower layers of the ocean get warmer as well. El Nino become weaker. 
It may also be the stabilizing and destabilizing forces influencing the phenomenon will eventually compensate for each other. More research is needed to better get a handle on it. ENSO is considered to be a potential tipping point in Earth's climate and on the global warming can enhance or alternate regional climate extreme events through a strengthened teleconnection. For example, increase in frequency of magnitude El Nino events have triggered warmer than usual temperatures over the Indian Ocean by modulating the walker circulation. This has resulted in a rapid warming of the Indian Ocean and consequently a weakening of the Asian monsoon. So this is basically what they're talking about now. So the red bars are El Nino, the blue is La Nina, and the gray is other or neutral. And this is the graph of global annual temperature anomalies from 1950 to uh, 2012, basically 62 years. And as you can see, look what's going on starting from about like 1978. Wow. It's just going up and up and up. In other words, it's getting warmer. So there you have it. That's what that graph is showing. Following the El Nino event in 97-98, the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory attributes the first large-scale coral bleaching event to the warming waters. Coral bleaching is when the coral polyps die than leaving just the, the coral themselves, which is simply the uh, secreted uh, deposition of the calcium carbonate from the polyps. Well, there's no more polyps living in there, so uh, calcium carbonate is a white mineral. So when you see white corals, those are dead corals. Based on model observed accumulated cyclone energy, ACE, I will not be discussing if you want me to, I can do the research for you, uh, but it's uh, that's a kind of a, a, a different uh, topic altogether. Of course, it's most likely uh, going to be related to what's going on in the atmosphere and the ocean, but uh, this is a different uh, topic altogether, um, and it's really based on uh, what the air and the oceans are doing. El Nino years usually result in less active hurricane season in the Atlantic Ocean, but instead favor shift to tropical cyclone activity in the Pacific. Compared to La Nina years, favoring above average hurricane development in the Atlantic and less so in the Pacific. So, summary. This is a little note to myself. Uh, ENSO is a cyclical phenomenon that occurs in the Pacific Ocean, basically straddling the equator. It is driven mainly by the Indonesian low pressure system shifting to the east and back to the west. When it shifts to the east, it is accompanied by weakening trade winds. This causes a warm blob, this is a nice technical term, warm blob of water over the eastern Pacific, suppressing any upwelling. That's during El Nino. During La Nina, the trade winds pick up intensity, pushing the Indonesian low back westward. The warm pool of water also moves west. Upwelling resumes on the eastern Pacific. With global warming, the Pacific appears to be in more of an El Nino state, since SFTs are warmer globally. This leads to more El Nino events and, strong, and often of stronger nature. And here's a summary from NOAA. Coupled ocean atmosphere phenomenon, it fluctuates between warmer than average, El Nino, cool, colder than average, La Nina condition. The changes in SSTs affect the distribution of tropical rainfall and atmospheric circulation features. That's the southern oscillation. Changes in intensity position of the jet streams and storm activity occur at higher latitudes because storms, uh, jet streams drive the, the uh, storm track directions. Monitoring and predicting ENSO is a key part of the CPC monthly seasonal uh, Temperature models do not agree on how ENSO will change with anthropogenic uh, climate change. Yeah, so that's there. That's what you call doing research. So um, let me now. I think I have some little videos queued up here. So let me get to that. You know, let's go right here. <laughs> El Nino is the warm water phase of the El Nino Southern Oscillation.
the most influential climate pattern used in seasonal forecasting. During El Nino, ocean temperatures over the Pacific. Pacific begin to warm up. Surface winds weaken and rainfall increases over the central or eastern Pacific while decreasing over Indonesia. Warmer oceanic and atmospheric conditions in the central and eastern Pacific fuel the jet stream. Because the central and eastern Pacific is warmer than normal during an El Nino, the jet shifts eastward with this energy source. A stronger eastward shifted jet stream favors low pressure in the Gulf of Alaska, higher pressure over Western Canada, and lower pressure over the southeastern United States. This type of influence from one region to another over large parts of the globe is referred to as a teleconnection. During winter, El Nino is generally associated with wetter than average conditions across the southern tier and drier than average conditions in the Pacific Northwest, the Northern Rockies, and the Ohio Valley. We typically observe below average temperatures across the southeastern United States and warmer than average conditions over the northern part of the country. Weather is what we experience every day. But remember, climate predictions based on El Nino tell us what kind of weather to expect on average and over a long period of time. From NOAA's Climate Prediction Center, I'm Ned Gardner. Warmer or colder than average ocean temperatures in one part of the world can influence weather around the globe. Boggles the mind, right? Here's how it works. During normal conditions, trade winds, which blow from east to west, push warm surface waters towards Asia, piling it up in the western Pacific. In some years, though, the trade winds weaken, the warm surface water moves eastward, and reduces upwelling of cold water off the coast of South America. Climatologists call this El Nino. Its climate impacts show up mostly in the wintertime over North America. The warmer ocean fuels an intensification and southward shift of the jet stream. This brings flooding to the southern United States and warmer, drier conditions over parts of the Pacific Northwest, northern U.S., and Canada. But eventually, those trade winds pick up again and sometimes become even stronger than normal. When that happens, they blow the warm water back into the western Pacific and restart the upwelling of cool water towards the surface in the eastern Pacific. These strong trade winds are a signature of what is called La Nina, unusually cold conditions in the tropical Pacific that displace the jet stream northward. La Nina can lead to drought in the southern U.S. and cooler temperatures, heavy rains, and flooding in the Pacific Northwest. El Nino and La Nina together are part of a cycle that influences extreme weather and can impact food production, water supply, and even human health, not just in the U.S., but in many parts of the globe. Okay, well, a quick little, quick little video there. Um, hope you found, hope, hope it helped pull this all together. Uh, let's see if I can get myself back here. There I am. Is a scary, uh, scary sight there. Let me reappear. Anyway, um, so I hope you found this uh, video informative. This is the first in a series. Um, you vote, you know, review, watch this video as often as you'd like to. You know, pause it on those uh, 
on all the graphics that I included in there to study it at further length. Um, pull up the URLs I provided and uh, there's some you know, really excellent explanations there as well. As I said, um, this is the first in several videos. Uh, the next one we'll be looking at the IPO and the uh, PDO uh, together. And then I'll probably conclude off with uh, the IOD for the Pacific Indian side of things. And then I will look, I'll do videos on the NAO, the AO, the AMO, and the AD. So quite a few videos in this series, but um, hopefully you'll find these informative, explaining um, how complex things are, how everything is interconnected. And all these systems and are so tied together, you do one little insult here and that's going to have repercussions throughout uh, the system uh, in other locations so i thank you for your time and uh the next this video in the series will be coming up shortly until then hey folks this is jim here reminding you to please subscribe my channel and please share my videos with others also remember to click the bell so that you know when I drop in a new video I also ask that you please consider becoming a patron of my channel and support the work that I do by going to patreon.com forward slash science talk with Jim Massa each word separated by an underscore and becoming a patron it's asking for as little as three dollars a month cost of a cup of coffee to support the work I do and keep my informative videos coming your way. Thank you. Thank you for your support.